Good day, grade 11th, grade 10th. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. In today's lesson, we're going to continue talking about electromagnetic radiation. We're going to learn quite a lot about it. And then we're going to move on to do some exam questions on electromagnetic radiation. And then if we have time, we're going to move on to physical and chemical uh, changes. Sorry, this should say changes. Okay, so let's talk about X-rays. We were talking about the different types of um, rays that were in the electromagnetic space spectrum. Um, last time we spoke about gamma rays, which were the highest energy rays, and they were the ones that we found in suns, and it's what, also what is given off in, in the nuclear explosions. Okay, so X-rays are the next uh, most energetic. They rays are emitted when high-speed electrons bombard a metal plate. So they are emitted when a high-speed electrons are bombard a metal plate. The electrons slow down and the energy is transferred as high energy electromagnetic radiation. And they are dangerous and have a high penetrating ability, but they are used to pass through soft tissue but not bones and so are used to photograph bones. So this is a typical x-ray and what happens is that the rays pass through the soft tissue so they get absorbed by the soft tissue or they pass right through. But yeah, what's actually happened is that the white bones or the bones reflect the x-rays and therefore we can get a beautiful picture of it. Okay, so this is reflected light. The white stuff is a reflected light. And you can see that this is obviously a hand with a whole bunch of bones. Um, well, it's obviously all just a bunch of bones. Okay, what talking about the x-rays being dangerous and have a high penetrating ability. In the olden days, back in the 19 before you were born, uh, 1980s and that, um, what happened was that the x-ray technologists actually had to wear a lapel, that um, a little measuring thing that would actually measure the amount of x-rays that they had been um, exposed to and after they got to that level they had to stop working as x-ray technologists um, which meant that the jobs funny enough that were done by x-ray technologists were usually by women it sounds like a sexist thing to say but it is um, it's true because it tended to be that women would work as x-ray technologists for a while and then they'd reach the quantity where they couldn't be exposed anymore and then that kind of suited them because then they generally and I know I'm sounding very sexist and I don't mean to they go off and get married and have kids okay so it suited them it was a nice short-term job for women okay nowadays anybody can be an x-ray technologist and it doesn't have to be the short-term job thing for the simple reason that they have improved a couple of things firstly they can now aim the x-rays much more accurately which is wonderful secondly if you've ever have x-rays these days you will notice that the x-ray technologist is not even in the room with you okay they're in like a little booth behind which they stand and it's totally sealed off from you and that there is lead lined okay because lead lead um x-rays can't get through lead so they can't get through lead pb plumbum lead okay so um, for that reason, if you have a lead lined container or room, then you are safe from x-rays. Also, what will happen is that you'll find that if you have an x-ray, they will cover your um, soft tissues. So it will generally be for women, it will be your breasts and your um, ovaries and that. And for boys, it will obviously be your testes and that area. Why? Because those tissues are much more susceptible to high energy radiation and that can damage them okay so therefore though it will cover that with for you okay so in order to protect yourself so we don't really like having lots and lots of x-rays because x-rays are dangerous and have a high penetrating ability and obviously what is happening is that that high energy is being absorbed by the cells so it's not really that great okay but an x-ray once in a blue moon is not going to hurt you so like I said, it passes through the soft tissue, but not the bones, and it gets reflected. So this is kind of a photograph of your bones from reflected light, x-rays in fact. Now let's talk ultraviolet radiation. Now I know that students sometimes struggle about whether ultraviolet or infrared are the higher energy. So the way I like to remember it is you've got... Uh, Roy G. Biv, but it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, 
ultraviolet and then infrared okay so ultra is like ultraman okay it's like an ultra marathon ultra is going to have way more energy than infrared okay so that's the way that i remember it so and that's how the, um, I know we say it's ready above, but that's how it's actually found where your violet has got more energy than your red within the visible spectrum. Okay, so now let's talk about ultraviolet radiation. This is the rays that are emitted by very hot objects like your sun and your electric arc welders. And that's why you can get what is called arc eye. So if you're staring without a shield at somebody's welding while they're welding, then your eyes will burn. And that's actually called arc eyes, arc eyes. Okay. And it actually means you burn and hurt your eyes, um, which means it might be difficult to see. Similarly, please don't do this. Just believe me. Trust me on this. If you look at to look straight in the sun, you would actually damage your eyes to the point that you'll actually have parts of your eye that will be um, destroyed um, some of the cones and rods um, if you do stare at the sun you you will find that immediately that you start if you've been glimpsed at the sun then what will happen is directly at the sun you will have bright spots and it'll take a while for you to be able to see properly okay now when you do that it, you might be able to you'll eventually be able to see properly well unless you stare at it for a very long time um, fine but the point is that what's actually happened is that there are some rods and cones in your eyes have been destroyed but luckily we've got enough that you won't miss a spot okay when you're looking it's not like you're going to go oh there's a little black spot or there's a little black spot okay but in all you will have ruined your vision okay you have decreased your vision and obviously if you stare at the sun for a long time then yes you will actually um, damage your eyes considerably Okay, so there's the sun. Obviously, this is a an image of the sun from outer space, and you can see that there's bright spots there, uh, higher energies, and this here is called a solar flare. It's basically huge amounts of energy given off by the sun. Ultraviolet rays of the sun can cause skin cancer. So this is these rays are what turns us white people, well, I say us, meaning me, um, into slightly darker white people. Uh, so if we lie in the sun, um, this is how we get a tan. The tan is caused by the skin cancer. I mean, by the ultraviolet, not by the skin cancer, by the ultraviolet. Okay, but now I have to say something to you and it's very important. Okay, there is a higher rate of skin cancer in darker skinned people than there is in white skinned people. In other words, if you are black or Indian or a colored person, you have a greater risk of, actually you don't have a greater risk of skin cancer. Just what happens is people for some reason think that if they are dark skinned, um, then you or olive skinned, if you want to think of it that way, then they don't need sunblock, okay? But just because you are dark colored, whether you're black or Indian or colored or whatever, um, and you are dark skin doesn't mean just because you can't see your skin going darker or red and just because you can't see your skin changing color doesn't mean that it's not being damaged by the sun. So there's actually a very high rate of skin cancer amongst the darker skinned people of South Africa for the simple reason that it's lack of knowledge. Okay, so I don't care, <laughs> and I tell my students this every day, I don't care what color your skin is. I don't care if the, you're the palest, whitest shade of Elsa, okay, in, um, you know, in Elsa and the Let It Go song, whatever, or if you are dark as the night, you will put sunscreen on when you go out because you will prevent um, you will prevent skin cancer, okay? I'm not going to say don't go out in the sun. I mean, you can't. It's South Africa. Let's get real. But you do actually need to put sunblock in, on, okay? And the more you burn, the worse it is, okay? So because sun, it's sun's, the, the, the badness of the ultraviolet rays, oh, that's a terrible explanation. The damage caused by the ultraviolet rays is actually additive, okay? So in other words, 
day when you're going to the sun, you go, oh yeah, I'm gonna go into the sun for just for a while. I want you sunblock, okay, fine. Your skin's body, your skin cells absorb the ultraviolet rays, but maybe not get rid of them totally. Next day you go into the sun, you go, oh look, I didn't get burnt at all yesterday. I'm gonna go into the sun some more. Okay, there, bang. You've now added more ultraviolet um, energy onto the skin cells, and then you end up with damaging your skin and possibly forming the beginning of skin cancer. Okay, so that's my little rant about ultraviolet rays. Also, also, ultraviolet rays don't have to, it doesn't have to be sunny for it to have high intensity of ultraviolet rays. Okay, the sun is given off the ultraviolet rays whether the clouds are there or not. Okay, so a lot of people think, oh look, it's cloudy, they don't need to worry, but in fact they do. Okay, if the ultraviolet rays are not absorbed by the clouds. They go straight through the clouds and onto your body. So you need to be careful of that. Okay, the ozone layer of our atmosphere protects us from these rays by absorbing them before they reach us. Okay, so when I was in school and they told us there was a hole in the ozone layer over Australia, um, and I'm a bit embarrassed to admit this, but I'm going to. So here is planet Earth, and here is my very bad Africa. Africa and over here is Australia. Right. And what we have is a layer of ozone in our outer layer. Now, ozone is O3, oxygen. It's O3. It's a very. Um, Jeez, I'm struggling with words today. It, it doesn't, it's a very unstable molecule. It's ozone, O3. It's a very unstable molecule. And the reason that we very much like our ozone is because what happens is the ultraviolet ray comes in, hits the ozone, the ozone changes into oxygen. And when it does that, obviously it absorbs some of the energy or most of the energy from the ultraviolet ray. And we love it. It's awesome. It keeps us not from burning to a cinder from the ultraviolet radiation in the sun's rays, okay? But now, so there's on this outer layer of the atmosphere, there is um, this ozone, okay, right? So when I was at school, they said that there was a hole in the ozone layer above Australia. So I honestly thought that, oop, no, hole above Australia. In other words, sun rays go straight through and everything else could go straight through. What they really meant by hole in the ozone layer, because remember that air can travel all the time and everything, so it's not a serious hole, is that there was a smaller, there was a smaller density. There was, the ozone layer was less dense above Australia. And the reason for that was because Australia is very hot and there was, at the time, Therefore, this, this was thinner, the ozone layer was thinner, should we say. Um, subsequently, due to the fact that a whole bunch of countries have agreed to not um, produce bad products that form um, carbon emissions and everything else, the ozone layers actually become thicker which is wonderful. One of the things that used to affect the ozone layer, and I'm just going to tell you this, and I'm not just ranting here, this is actually stuff you need to know, is CFCs, carbon, uh, carbon fluorochlorides. Okay, carbon fluorochlorides were used in refrigerators to, as a group as a coolant and they used to be used in spray deodorants. But the problem is these CFCs would then go up into the atmosphere and they would bond with the ozone, okay? And then there'd obviously be no ozone available when the ultraviolet radi radiation came in from the sun. So that would be the problem. But now they no longer use CFCs as refrigerant and they don't use it in deodorant sprays. And that was just an example. There's also things like sulfur dioxide is not given off, etc, etc. Okay, so ultraviolet rays of the sun can cause skin cancer and the ozone layers will protect us. Ultraviolet rays can also kill harmful bacteria and are used for this purpose in some air conditioning units. So what you might see in your air conditioning unit if they're very fancy and you take it apart, okay, is air conditioning units are just like boxes, right? Okay, but I'm talking about the outer bit, is what might happen is there might be, if you open it, you might see that there's an, an UV ray tube that is basically shining down into the box. And as the air transfers in or out, depending on which way this is set, it will kill the harmful bacteria, which is wonderful because air conditioning units are basically breeding grounds for 
germs. So this is a very good way of protecting people. Um, another thing that they can use ultraviolet rays for is to kill the bacteria on medical equipment. Um, so basically they will actually, it's amazing, they'll put the medical equipment into a metal box and shine the ultraviolet light on it and it will actually kill the bacteria on that medical equipment. Um, and as you can see here, it can also be used as what they've done here, which is quite clever as well, is they've used a mark on, on this, um, the, what the Costa Rica note, okay? And what they do is, you can't see it with the naked eye, but if you put it under a UV light, you will actually see this. So that proves that this is actually an authentic note. Right, so those are all the things you need to know about ultraviolet radiation. Then let's talk visible light. So visible light, like I said, what you need to know about white, uh, visible light, which is pretty cool, is that white light, white light, which is the white light that's coming in there, can be broken up into the colors of the rainbow through a prism. Okay, through a prism, and that's what it is there, 60 degree prism. It goes through a 60 degree prism into a rainbow. Okay, so the the cool thing about that is that obviously then we can we know that white light is a combination of all the colors and now guys if any of you take art i don't want you to get confused between paint and color and paint and light if i had to take all the colors of the rainbow and mix them up in paint i would end up with a horrible black a dirty black okay if i didn't do it in exactly the right consistencies okay so if you are a painter, you will think white is the absence of color and black is a combination of all the colors, okay? But we're talking about light now. And black is the absence of light, okay? In other words, over here, this would be an absence of light. There's no light there. And white is made, is the, all the colors in the rainbow make up um, the white light. So white composes, gets, is, consists of all the colors of the rainbow. Okay, so what are the colors of the rainbow? I always remember it like this, Roy G. Biv. So it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Okay, now I want to explain this to you because this is very cool. This is a double rainbow. Now, let's first talk about this rainbow. You can see that this rainbow is the normal one. There's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. It's not often that you can see all the colors in the rainbow, so don't panic if you can't see all your seven colors in your rainbow in, an, in the sky, because obviously there's quite a lot of diffraction. That light ray is not being staring straight into your eye. And also there might be air pollution between you and the rainbow. Okay, but now, why is this happening? Well, what is actually happening is that the water droplets that the light is coming through either cloud or rain, and these water droplets form like this when they fall, they do that. And if you think about that, that is almost the shape of an equilateral prism. So that's exactly what happens. The white light is going through these, and as it comes through, it, the white light is coming in, it goes, gets refracted, and then it gets refracted some more, and it breaks up into the, I'm gonna get there, into the rainbow. Okay, so it breaks up into the, the, the spectrum. Now this here you'll notice is a double rainbow, but what's important and what do you need to notice here? You need to realize that it's reversed, okay? Yeah, this is red, orange, oopsie, oopsie, orange, yellow, I can't see the green, but there's blue and there's indigo and there's violet. And if you look over here, okay, it definitely is not as clear, but you can definitely see the red and that's the yellow and actually the green's a little bit easier to see there. The blue's there and it looks a bit like violet is over there. I mean, obviously the green's all the way there. I just couldn't draw it in. So do you see it's a mirror image? So the second rainbow is going to be a mirror image of the first one. And if you had to have a third one, it would be the mirror image of this as well, which is that. And apparently, theoretically, you should have multiples of these. And they, in other words, I've only ever seen a double rainbow. Okay, I've seen the rainbow and one like this. Okay, um, but theoretically, but you'll see as much um, it's it's a lot less intense. You can't really see it. It's quite 
faded, okay? So theoretically, apparently they repeat all the way through the cloudy bits, okay, or wherever it's raining. Um, and when they repeat, they're again going to swap. So then it'll be red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, that way, okay? Um, but like I said, I've never seen anyone pass this. And I think it's probably because the gap also gets bigger because these are effectively wavefronts. Anyway, now let's talk infrared radiation. So remember what I said to you that ultraviolet is the ultra and the high energy one, okay? Whereas infrared is now lower, okay? It's low energy. Yeah, the particles object of objects vibrate and as a result emit radiation in the infrared region of the spectrum. So all particles of objects vibrate. We know this, okay? But some of them vibrate enough that they emit radiation. So infrared radiation affects some photographic film. So we can take infrared photographs of objects in the absence of light. For example, and this is an example of a hairdryer blowing obviously hot air out. And you can see that obviously the brighter the color, the hotter it is, okay? And the darker the color, the the cooler it is. So you can see that with this hairdryer, the handle and the wire is all very cool, which is just as well because we want to tight, don't want it, we want to be able to hold the hairdryer. And all this here is not is quite cool as well. But there, over there, there is the hot air. Okay. So we can use our infrared photography to take photographs like this. You can also use infrared binoculars or infrared um a photographic paper to allow us to view or take photographs of objects or animals at night. Um, infrared goggles are actually often used in, um, well, in warfare um, for soldiers when they are trying to attack people at night. Um, now, if you've ever watched the movies, you'll see that the infrared goggles that they tend to wear are green in color. At which point you go, but I don't understand it's infrared and why they watch where now remember first of all, infrared is just the name we give it. We're not expecting red rays, okay? Infrared is just the it's the um the less energetic waveform on that side of the red um a part of the spectrum. Okay, so the reason they green is because they're tinted like that because of the fact that that gives you a gentler change for your eyes. In other words, you're going from not being able to see anything in the dark to having a screen where you can see stuff like this deer, okay? But if you're going from pitch black to being able to see, and then say you have to take your goggles off again, because you might be going into a building to, I don't know, rescue somebody, then obviously it's going to be that, um, you need to um, be able to take your goggles off and see. So what they do is they use green tinted glass or green film over it to make it easier for you to be able to see what is going on. Okay, so that's what happens in the military. Another uses of infrared radiation. Um, first of all, all your remote controls are infrared. In fact, <laughs> Um, the old cell phones, again, before your time, used to have infrared as the option of how to transfer information. And you had to be quite close to the person and, and you had to point at your cell phones at each other's cell phones. Um, in fact, you had to line them up. There was like a little red bar on your cell phone. You had to line up their cell phone, your cell phone with their cell phone to, in order to make sure that you would transfer information. So say for example, now you guys, if you guys want to transfer, um, say you've downloaded a song and you want to transfer from your cell phone to other cell phone, what do you do? You either send it via WhatsApp or you could Bluetooth it, um, um, but Bluetooth tends to take a while. Um, but nowadays, in the olden days, we'd actually have to take two cell phones and line them up so that the two ports of the infrared ports were opposite each other. And then we could transfer information using the infrared. And it took a while and you were not, you could not use your cell phone or move your cell phone during that time. Otherwise, the transfer would not work. Okay, another use for infrared. These are two uses for infrared radiation, but they're medical. This one here is using 
um, it to tell the temperature of the person. So this is how digital thermometers work. Basically, it measures the temperature using an infrared uh, monitor, which is basically tells you how much infrared radiation has been given off, which because again, the more heat being given off, the more infrared radiation, which then gives a measure of the temperature. Another thing which is used quite often with infrared radiation, which is very cool, is um, it's used for recovery if you've hurt your muscles or whatever, because infrared radiation is quite a, a good radiation because it's absorbed by the skin and the muscles in the body, it, but it's low energy. It means that it can help repair muscles that have been damaged. Okay, so use infrared radiation as a way to help fix muscles that have been injured. Now let's talk microwaves. Now when I say microwaves, you think, well, that machine in the corner of your mom's kitchen that you use to heat up your two minute noodles or whatever, okay? Um, okay, that is a microwave, admittedly, but microwaves I'm talking about are waves on the micro level, okay? <laughs> in other words, remember that you've got millimicro nano, um, so if I had to give you that this was meters, then you've got milli, micro, and nano. Milli is 10 to the minus 3, micro is 10 to the minus 6, and nano is 10 to the minus 9. So what I'm talking about by microwaves is I'm talking about waves transverse waves that have a wavelength that is approximately at least 1 times by 10 to the negative 6 meters long. Okay, that's what I'm talking about with microwaves. Yes, there are microwaves used in the microwave machine, which is why we um, call it that. Okay, so the wavelength of these waves is only a few centimeters. Microwaves are used for satellite communication, for telephone and television. In other words, the transfer of information from your cell phone and or from the television or from satellites is usually on the microwave level. So microbes are used to cook food in microwave ovens. Now what actually happens is the water molecules in the food absorb the energy okay which causes the water molecules to vibrate that's heating the water and cooking the food so microwaves themselves don't directly cook the food what they do is they basically excite the water molecules within the food or around the food and when it does that it causes the water molecules to heat up and then that cooks the food so the microwaves themselves do not cook the food okay so now, again, let's talk about microwaves. Um, let's see, yeah. So if you've ever looked at a microwave, you'll see that it's quite difficult to see through this front screen. There is um, a kind of a mesh over the screen. You can still see through it, especially if your light inside your microwave is working, but it's got a tiny mesh like this, if you had to look at it carefully. Okay, now I want you to do yourselves a favor and not go home and decide to rip the mesh off after I've spoken to you about it because then you will all die and I feel very guilty. Okay, so the reason that they've got that mesh is that microwaves can actually move through glass. They have enough energy that they can trans be transmitted through glass. So that's a problem. Okay, but, but microwaves again do not get transferred through lead. So what somebody thought of, which is actually very, very clever, is they took a lead-lined um, plastic or paper, mesh paper, and they pasted it on the front of the door, the front of the window door, okay? In other words, they've placed this mesh over here. And if you look at the holes in the mesh, you will see that they're very small. They are smaller than a centimeter 
okay? And the reason for that is microwaves have got a longer wavelength than that, so therefore they are going to be stuck inside this container until they have basically bounce themselves out of the energy. Okay, so that is why microwaves are safe for people. So people always say, oh, there's an old wife sale that says pregnant women shouldn't stand in front of the microwave because the microwave can cause damage to the fetus. Only if you jippo it. If you go along and you, microwaves are made to not work unless the doors are closed, okay? Sometimes you can jippo it by pushing a little button inside the door, the inside door, of the microwave and then it'll work with the door open but please don't do that because then you will die again <laughs> because what happens is then all the energy within the microwave is going to be emitted out of that area where the door would normally be in okay and then what have happens is that you will be standing near the microwave will experience all that energy all that energy from the microwaves and you will get hurt and you will die so please don't do that Okay, now radio waves. Radio waves are very cool. They are, and I, I, you have to be very careful. If you're sitting listening to the radio, okay, so here is you, and let's pretend that you're sitting listening to the radio, and I don't know, there's a top 40 on or something. You're sitting listening to this radio, right? Now, there are sound waves that are traveling, admittedly, to your ear. Okay, but those sound waves are longitudinal, longitudinal sound waves. They are not radio waves, okay? Now, to get this information into the radio so the radio can give it the sound waves, there has to be a signal from a big tower somewhere that gives off the information. Okay, I don't know how these towers look. Okay, so there's got to be a tower that's giving off that information. And those are your radio waves. These towers are giving off energy in the form of radio waves. And what's special about the radio waves? First of all, they're very long. They've got a very long wavelength, okay? They're easy to fracture or bend because they have long wavelengths, which means they can bend around buildings or over mountains. So for example, a medium wave radio is easily transmitted. Radio 702 transmits at 702 kilohertz, and the wavelength of that is 427 meters, okay? Shortwave radios are reflected by the ionosphere, resulting in erratic reception of shortwave radio. So you only use shortwave radios when you're very, very desperate. A very high frequency radio waves are called FM frequency mod or frequency modulated radio transmission. Okay, so very high frequency radio waves are used for frequency modulated radio transmission. VHF is very high frequency and UHF is ultra high frequency. Now, if you ever have tried to um, what is the word? If you've ever tried to um, use your remote to automatically find a remote in your TV, to automatically tune your TV in, okay? You, and you just press the button, you say, go for it, go tune. And you watch the screen, you will see that it'll tick through, and it'll tick through from like zero to like 500, and it'll say VHF. And then if you're lucky, depending on what your TV is, et cetera, et cetera, it will then change over automatically to UHF and then tick, th tick through all the UHF channels to try and find all the best possible viewing pleasure of you for you. In other words, they'll try and find the best channels that have the best reception. So VHF is very high frequency and UHF is ultra high frequency and both of these are used for TV. Okay, that's what gives us a signal for TV. Now, VHF and UHF waves are not easily diffracted and can soak us and soak our shadows behind buildings. Okay, this is why the transmitting aerials are needed for TV transmission. Okay, so if you have to look at this, I want you to watch carefully. Yeah, 
is a UA high frequency, V, very high frequency, and ultra high frequency. So high frequency is the blue one, okay? It can get from one antenna to the next antenna without any problems. Very high frequency and ultra high frequency, these are the ones that are used for TV. But do you see that the very high frequency can get as far as the mountain? But the ultra high frequency doesn't get, even get further than the first little block, the first little assembly block. And that's because they're not easily diffracted. They don't bend very easily. Okay, and for that reason, we tend to use the big dishes, etc., to try and pick up our signal. Okay. Right, so now let's go through some examples. It says, Joshua breaks his leg playing Sims and goes to have x-ray second. I'm not quite sure how he broke his leg playing Sims, but anyway. X-ray is emitted by the x-ray machine with a wavelength of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. So the wavelength is 1,5 times by 10 to the negative 11 meters. That's the wavelength, okay? What do we know? We know that V is equal to lambda frequency, where V is actually 3 times by 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay, we also know, what does it say? What is the frequency? We also know that period is equal to 1 over frequency. And we also, okay, so we've got the 3 times by 10 to the 8. We've got the wavelength. Do you agree that we can find the frequencies? Let's do that. So we've got C is equal to lambda F. C is the speed of light, which is 3 times by 10 to the 8. Lambda is the wavelength, which is 1,5 times by 10 to the negative 11. And we want the frequency. So do you agree we can both divide both sides by 1,5 times by 10 to the negative 11? 1,5 times by 10 to the negative 11. So therefore, our frequency is, so let's get out our frequency. Let's get our calculator. And we can say it is 3 exponent Oh, sorry, I don't know what that other stuff is. 3 exponent 8. 3 exponent 8. Then it's divide by 1.5 exponent negative 11 equals 2 times by 10 to the 19. So the frequency is 2 times by 10 to the 19 hertz. That's the frequency. Now it says, how much energy do the X-ray photons have? Now remember we spoke about Einstein's theory E equals HF, where H was Planck's constant, and F was the frequency, and E is the energy in joules. Okay, and do you remember that we said that H was what? We said that H was, remember it's Planck's constant, is 6.63 times by 10 to the negative 34. The frequency we have, we've just worked out as 2 times by 10 to the 19, so we can work out the E. So E is going to be 6.63 times by 10 to the negative 34 multiplied by 2 times by 10 to the 19. So again, we need to get our calculator out. And we go 6.63 exponent negative 34 mult whoopsie, not plus, delete. Multiplied by 2 exponent 19 equals 1.33 times 10 to the negative 14. So therefore, E is 1 comma 3, 3 times 3, 3 times by 10 to the negative, sorry, I'm going blank, negative 14, negative 14 joules. So that is the energy that these X-ray photons have. Okay, grade 10s, we will start with this question and do a couple of questions on the electromagnetic spectrum and radiation, and then move on to physical and chemical change. Have a great day. Yeah.